Robinson, and I am giving a webinar today. Um, if you've joined us, you should see us on the ARM software webinars, and there are some handouts uh, that go along with it. Um, I have found that some of the numbers I want to talk about are a little bit small. Um, so, and, but I'm trying to be more visual with this presentation. So uh, I get, I've, I've made the handouts available if you need to look at the numbers in more detail. So let's go over to the presentation itself. And, oh, um, while I'm on this website, some of this is based on a discussion I gave at the Agronomy Society meetings, optimal treatment dispersions in the rectangular areas. Um, this is a continuation of those ideas. So um, there's some background here and let's get to the presentation itself. And so we'll start play. And I need to move some stuff around because I've got these chat dialogues and all these other things in my window. Um, let's see. There we go, that looks a little better. So the title is Uniformity Simulations to Evaluate uh, Trial Randomization Quality. Oh, that's what I have to do, I can't hit my button. And so to give you some background of, of the, the, the basis for our discussion today, I have a project and I, I find myself, I have some hobbies and I like to use my hobbies um, to give me ideas of, to design experiments. And so the project that I'm working on, the hobby that I'm working on is some pasture land that's been in my family for a few years. Um, that has a, a large collection of, of native plants mixed in and is kind of rare in these parts to have um, this much diversity in a pasture land. And so what I really want to do is uh, in this pasture, about 35 acres in eastern South Dakota, the north 10 acres contains a good mix of wildflowers. Um, and here you can see some lead plants, some milkweed, some scurf pea. Uh, and the south half is really dominated by introduced species like brome grass. Um, none of the very, very, it's sparse in the native tall grass species. So what I want to do is transplant, transfer some of these native flowers from the north end to the south end. So I'm calling this a prayer restoration project. Um, and so part of that project is I wanted to do an experiment on a seed germination assay. That is, I collected seed from the north part of the field and I took 10, uh, 10 species and I wanted to see how well they germinated uh, in order to prepare them for transplanting. And so this is my experimental setup. I have 10 native species and two checks. One check, you can see missing plots in my uh, trial map. Uh, because this was uh, cilantro as my check on just a general germination rate. And cilantro germinates very quickly, it's kind of a weed. And then the other here, uh, the other check was a commercial variety of prairie coneflower or purple coneflower that is one of the species I want to reintroduce, but I want to reintroduce the native population. So I have a 12 treatment experiment and six replicates. Now I could have done this as a CRD, completely random design, because this is essentially a greenhouse study. Um, and we really don't need to worry about heterogeneity in greenhouse studies. But I was going to put this in a window where I knew there would be a natural gradient from one part of the greenhouse to the next um, that might create a fertility gradient. And our conventional wisdom is that when you have a fertility gradient, you arrange your treatments in blocks so that you capture the spatial heterogeneity in between the blocks and not within the blocks. So you lay your blocks out uh, perpendicular to the heterogeneity in your field. Um, very rarely do we get a field where we can have a nice linear spatial trend like that. But for the, for the purposes of today's example, this this type of arrangement um, is, is going to give us a, a platform to talk about experimental uh, block sizes. 
And so keep in mind, we are dealing with a trial of six uh, replicates in 12 treatments. And in our ARM trial map dialogue, we see that there are two descriptors for uh, trial map quality. And one is replicate shape, and the other is treatment uh, dispersion metrics. Now I'm going to focus on replicate shape, although I will touch a little bit on the treatment dispersions. Now in the replicate shape, we have these suggested block sizes and that we recommend block sizes of three or four, six or 12. And that's one of the reasons I picked this experiment uh, as an example to explore uh, block dimensions because um, it fits, it gives us uh, some different re uh, rearrangements uh, that we can consider. And so what I wanna consider then is here's the trial that I executed. I laid out the replicates in a one by 12 block. And then I said, well, what about a two by six? Is this a better arrangement? And how about the three by four? Is this the best? Notice I'm not changing anything about the physical layout of my field, the physical process of uh, uh, implementing this experiment hasn't changed. Okay, just what I am considering to be blocks. Now, some briefly, some math. Oh, um, part of my hobby then in this, uh, the, the, this pasture is to go through and take pictures of the various native flowers and the insects that um, populate them. Uh, so uh, I'm gonna intersperse this discussion with a few uh, photographs. Oh, so the next one. So briefly, and I'm not going to do a lot of math today, but briefly we're going to review when we calculate the two-way analysis of variance, we uh, try to detect differences among treatments by calculating the treatment mean minus the overall mean, taking the sums of those squares, calculating a mean square and getting an F ratio. And we do a similar calculation to calculate a block mean which is represented as Y um, circle J is our replicate mean. Take the deviation from the overall mean, sum those up and call that our block effect. And that decomposes our experimental error um, and reduces our uh, mean square error. Um, so that gives us a better um, estimate of our F ratio for our treatments. So we're gonna focus on what our F ratio is, but we're going to take, I want to keep in the back of your mind that how we calculate block effects is going to affect our decompositions of these sums of squares. So what we've been arguing um, as kind of ad hoc is that when we calculate the mean for replicate six, when we have a replicate laid out in a row of 12 treatments, um, well, we're taking an average over this long stretch of space, and then we're going to compare that with the average over this stretch of space. Now, if we change the block size to three by four, um, we see that we're, we're covering a smaller region of the field. And intuitively, we might think that, excuse me, I'm going to sip a tea we might think that we have a better estimate of what the mean is for that replicate when we don't have the plots as spaced out. So this is our intuition. Well, can we test this? And one of the ways to test this is to run simulations. And here is just a picture of a bumblebee on uh, what's called blazing star or gay feather, depending on what you call it. And I forget the Latin name. Um, this is one of the, the seeds I put in that experiment. It turns out to germinate quite well, which I'm happy about because I really like this flower. Um, there are some commercial varieties available if, if you want to put uh, native flowers in your garden or at least native to your region. So um, I really like this picture. I put it in just to be entertaining. So what we're going to do to simulate what might happen with different randomizations is we're going to take data from uniformity trials. That we start, and I, I think I could have taken that simulator. I'll put it back up. 
Um, we're going to start with uniformity trial data. And for this discussion, we're going to use some that are available in the literature. We're going to copy values from those plots into our proposed randomization. We're essentially going to just enter those as if those were observed uh, plot values, analyze it as if it were an actual trial. Now, there are no treatments. So in this case, the null hypothesis is true. We expect large F values because that's, that's what we use to reject the null hypothesis. Um, and so we tend to expect to be our, our probability of that F ratio test to be non-significant. Unless the treatments that we've laid out in our randomization for some reason are confounded with a spatial trend. If we don't get our spatial trend right, we can have one treatment in the good part of the field and another treatment in the bad part of the field. And we might think that there's actually a treatment effect. So what we want to do when we do this simulation is we do it multiple times and try to determine how often we actually do get a significant p-value. So let's start out with an idea of what the data set we're looking at. And I'm going to use Mercer and Hall. This is one of the classic examples of the literature of uniformity trial data. Um, I've copied the abstract here. I'm not going to read through it. Uh, I assume if you really want to read it, you can uh, pull down or the PDF or um, uh, pause and uh, or rewind on the, the recording. Um, but this is something that was done a lot in the early years to understand the random variables that we're dealing with when we do trials in the field. Um, and I am probably sometimes going to say the term field when I'm talking about a two-dimensional mathematical abstract concept that represents the variation in fertility in this die in this trial map or this assessment map. And if I'm talking specifically about a place where you plant crops, I might use in this context a cropland. Now, if I'm talking to my brother and I say I'm going to go to the field, he'll know what I'm talking about because I need the traditional agricultural sense. But I might in this discussion talk about a field being an abstract concept. And so this is a, a measurement of a random field. And it's a random field in the sense that some parts have lower inherent fertility, like up on this corner, some parts have higher inherent fertility. And so what we're going to be interested then is we take our proposed randomization, our proposed trial map with treatment number 6, 11, 12, 7, 1, 4, that's our, our randomization, and superimpose that upon this random spatial field and then do our analysis of variance and get our p-value. And our p-value is whether we accept or reject the null hypothesis. Now, this, this kind of simulation, I'm not going to claim as brand new or unique. Um, Harold Van Ness um, did some study on the spatial nature of randomization and used something like this as in his exploration. We will touch on Harold Van Ness's work, Dr. Van Ness's work later on, because he, he devised a series of spatially balanced, optimally balanced designs um, that we uh, uh, make available through our uh, uh, randomization settings. So this is what we're doing to try to understand how a proposed randomization is going to behave when it is placed on an agricultural field. And so we're gonna simulate multiple times. We're gonna repeat this process. In the absence of a true treatment effect, and the treatment that is when the null hypothesis can be assumed to be true. Let me see, I have to check my watch here real quick. Um, we expect about a 5% significance level, 5% or less, in about 5% of the trials. Now I'm hiding some mathematical sin here. Um, under certain conditions, under certain assumptions, I can say it's going to be exactly 5% significance or less 5% of the time but we don't meet those assumptions in these simulations. Okay. It does look like it's going to be pretty close. So to give you an idea of what we're doing then, here's a simulated trial. This is the second one in the series where I just shift the plots over, just one row over in the field. This, this could have been your, uh, an experiment and just in starting at one part in the field, you just move over a little bit. And superimposing this plan 
on this particular randomization, I ended up with a significant treatment p-value, the p-value 0.048. Um, and I would have failed to reject the null hypothesis in this simulation. All right. Then I move it up one from my, my original randomization and superimpose my trial map. And this time I got a p-value of 0 0.05. So I would have rejected the null hypothesis. Now, so just to review this, the same trial map over the same source of uniform data, uniform field data, gives me different p-values depending on an interaction with my randomization and this random spatial field. Now, the visualization of this is over 182 simulations. I can look at the distribution of those particular p-values. And the histogram is what more most familiar with. So here, in six trials, I had a p-value of 0 .0, 0 0.1 or less. I had six plus um, 17, I think, at a p-value of um, 0.2 or less, and 40-some um, at 0.3 or less. So that's what we see from the histogram. That's translated into this empirical accumulative distribution function that is shown below, where five of 180 amount to about oh, less than th about 3%. So at my nominal p-value of 0.5, I had a simulated rate, uh, p-value rate of about 0 0.03. So my simulated p-values were slightly less than expected um, if I got a one for one, 5% um, of my p-values were 5% or lower, 20% of my p-values 20% or lower. That's my expected one-to-one -one relationship. And I see for this randomization simulated over this data, I had a slightly lower error rate. So we're going to be concerned on whether this simulated empirical cumulative distribution function, which is derived from the histogram, is below our expected value or whether it's above our expected value. That's going to give us an idea of whether or not we have an experiment that is fair. If it's right on the line, if it's overly rigorous, it will tend to be below the line because our p-value rate will be less than our nominal rate. And if it's overly um, generous, it will give us uh, a curve that is above the line. And so I think I duplicated this. I think I've covered everything I need in this slide. So one way to get an idea of the quality of our particular randomization is we do 180 simulations and we do 30 different randomizations. We can visualize then if we had been in ARM, we just click the re-randomize button, analyze that trial, click re-randomize, analyze that one, repeated that 30 times. And we see this um, oblate shape distribution where some treatments where I'm going to argue when they are convex, which means they are below the diagonal line, we have a better control of type one error rate because our ability to get 5% of our trials where we fail to reject the null hypothesis when the null hypothesis is true is lower rate than what we expect where some trials are gonna have a higher type one error rate because our, the number of trials where we would fail to reject the null hypothesis when we know the null hypothesis is true is going to be higher than we agree to, we decide that we're going to accept our error rate. Now, that might be a lot of talking, right? And this is really, these are just slides that review what I just said. We're, re we're doing uh, inferring plot yields from uniformity data. There are no treatments. Our null hypothesis is true. We are willing to be failing to reject the null hypothesis 5% of the time, but we don't, we don't get that number depending on our randomization. So what might increase this? Well, this is an undesirable randomization. 
and I, I want to very much stress this for this group, this randomization was not created by ARM. When you click ARM and you click create protocol or create trial and you get a randomization, ARM did not give me this. I had to manually edit this map to create it to be undesirable. And what I needed to do is to move all of the treatments into groups. So treatment five are all within two columns. Treatment 11 are spread over three columns. Over here, I have treatment seven in three columns. So they are very much clustered together. This is not something you will normally get. Okay, in fact, we have tools that very much avoid this. This is what I call a cheating experiment. It's designed to cheat. And if we look at the simulations of this that I've just shown you, we can see how much it's cheating. And in this case, I look at our nominal alpha value at 0 0.5 corresponded to about 45% of the simulated trials. So 80 some of these 180 trials, we would have declared significant treatment differences. So when I say that a convex shape, did I say convex? I'm gonna have to go back and remember. Concave curves, sorry, I'm gonna do that. This concave curve tells us that this randomization is going to give us a very high type one error rate. It is also a very unlikely randomization. Now this is a randomization. This could have happened by chance when you randomize a trial. It could have happened. It's not very likely out of the 30, um, we see it's very different from the 30 that we get, uh, that I get in the first simulation. And in fact, if I do a hundred randomizations, it's very different from a hundred. If I do a thousand randomizations, I don't even get close to the type of behavior that we see in this trial, All right? Now, some of these are probably more extreme than I might want to accept, but they're not as bad as the one where I set up to cheat. So let's go back to block dimensions. This, by the way, is lead plant, another one of my favorite species in this pasture. So we want to understand how this uniformity of simulation helps us, uh, uh, it, it might influence type one error rates. So we have our three block shapes, our one by 12, two by six, three by four. And if we look at our histograms, well, it doesn't really help us much to compare just one of these. We saw from the earlier diagrams that we can, we can get a, a lot of, we can get some different behavior from similar looking trial maps. So what we wanna do is look at the pattern of the distribution of the concavity convexity of the different simulations. And now remember our, our undesirable was very much bowed above the main line. And when we randomize in a three by four pattern, we have very, very less likely to have that upward uh, bend. I'm, gonna, I'm just gonna forget about trying to say convex or concave. We're not above the line as often. We're not as far above the line as often. So this, this is the heart of what I wanted to simulate um, and understand our, our, uh, our recommendations and how valid they are is that we do get better control of our type one error rates by making our block sizes more uniform. We are less likely to confound a treatment effect with a spatial effect by making a rectangular block size. And in this case, this was an easy thing for me to do because I can just swap things around and not change my trial dimensions. So for very little cost, we can get a, a, a good, good uh, gain in our confidence in our trials. And even over um, hundreds of randomizations, we see that we have uh, less likely to get a, a, a cheating or an unfair, or let's say an, a, 
overly generous randomization. We are much less likely to get one of those. So uniform block dimensions give us uniform type one error rates. But we also wanna take a moment to consider statistical power. Um, these are Mexican hats, by the way, they're called our prairie, prairie coneflower. And this magenta patch is a, a, an unusual type. Um, I need to remember to mark these so I can go back and harvest them. Now, recall um, before we, we wanna take a moment to think about when we do a trial, we are actually trying to balance two types of error. And I've talked about the type one error where we fail to reject the null hypothesis when we have a true null hypothesis. That's something that we can simulate very easy in what I've shown you. But we also wanna control for type two error where we reject the null, where we, we fail to reject the null hypothesis, even though there is a true treatment effect. We overlook something important. Okay? We tend to focus on our type one error rate because we tend to have our alpha at 0 0.05, which is more stringent than our beta, which we have at about 0.2, our statistical power we set at 80%. So we're willing to overlook a true treatment effect 20% of the time. And we do um, have tools in ARM for planning to achieve desired power in our, um, in our uh, um, uh, power and efficiency calculations. Um, but today we're gonna talk about the simulated uh, type two error. And how do we simulate that? Well, in order to do a power simulation um, to match the uh, uh, a significant simulation is we copy plot acceptance. I select a single treatment, add a percent mean difference to the plots for that treatment, and then go ahead and do the analysis just like I did it. Count the number of trials where I get a significant treatment effect. Increase my percent mean difference, repeat the process, and then do that for each treatment. Let's see if I can explain that a little better with the graph. So here was my original simulation. I added 3% to one treatment and one treatment only. I calculated the treatment p-value. So the original um, simulation, I got a treatment p-value of 0 0.03. And in the second one, I got a treatment p-value of 0 0.02. So I'm moving closer to a significant treatment effect. Now, a 3% treatment mean that's, that is a true treatment effect, but it's a statistically almost undetectable treatment effect. And so I add that percent. So I add a 3% to one data column, add a 6%, add 9%, 12%, 15%. This is what it looks like if I were doing the simulation in ARM and adding it to the just the assessments for treatment one, leaving the other treatments alone. And we see for this particular treatment, in this sampled simulated trial that I achieved a treatment probability F of treatment significance at 15% um, mean difference. So in this case, we were able to detect a, um, in this trial, we were able to detect a 15% mean difference for this particular trial on that particular set of plots. So then to simulate power, we repeat the original simulations and we add a percent mean difference and see that we move towards, well, we move towards the upper left corner. Remember I talked about the cheating trial where I'm almost certainly uh, going to find significance. What we are trying to find is where this curve as we add our true treatment effect intersects our nominal significance value at 0.5 with our nominal power at 0.8. When those lines cross, we can consider that our um, percent mean difference that can be detected um, at 80% power under these simulations. And in this case, that falls at about 22, given give or take. This is the line for 21, that's the line for 24. So under this situation, we have a statistical power 
at 80% of a 22% mean difference. Okay. Now, this is not exactly the same as the power we use when we talk about um, planning for experiments and we do our um, number of replicates. Um, we tend to hold our CV constant when we do this and we look at our possible percent mean differences. I'm going to not go a lot of time on this slide. I just want to caution you that if you're going to try to duplicate what these curves are, we can't quite duplicate it under these conditions. Because when we do the simulations, we find that the coefficient of variance tends to vary with where we put it in the field. And that's an interaction with this random spatial field and our randomization. Um, our 30 simulations, the one that we picked had a coefficient of variance that ranged from 0.8% to 14%. Um, so it's not quite the same concept that we're working with, but it helps us understand um, how our trials behave. Um, because I said that the trials that, well, let's just, let's think, let's move on to the next slide. Uh, the other thing is that we want to be cautious when comparing this to power efficiency calculations is we are basing these calculations on the treatment t-test, whereas I'm looking at p-values generated from the treatment F test. Um, they aren't quite the same uh, when it comes to the power calculations. So, block dimensions. Ooh, I think I left something out. Oh, I did, I skipped over it. Sorry, I skipped this one. This is my cheating trial. And notice that the cheating trial starts closer to a significant p-value. And so we find that we can achieve 80% power on this cheating trial. I want to say it's about 16% uh, significant difference in the treatments than the 22% we saw with our uh, actual randomization. Sorry, I hope I didn't confuse you too much with that. I, I skipped over. Um, that illustration. So when I talk about um, better control of type 1 error versus type 2 error, we're going to have a lower type 2 error rate with this trial, but that's because we're starting out with uh, lower significance. So when we get back to block dimensions, then we see that we can have a better balance of both type 1 and type 2 error because we're starting more along this main axis. And the argument I'm going to make is when we do a randomization, we might want to choose the fairest trial, not the one that gives us the best control of type one error, because that also gives us control better or, or gives us lesser control of type two error. But we want to look for a randomization that is going to be fair and balanced. And similarly, um, we can look at these block dimensions and does it give us a change in our type two error? And for this simulation, um, I found that really it's not an impressive difference. Um, we have a percent mean difference by the one by two at 22%, whereas three by four, we were able to detect a percent mean difference at 20%, gives us a little bit more power. Um, let's see. And so this is where I kind of got myself in trouble preparing for this webinar, because what I've done up to now is something I can do in ARM. And there's something that we can roll into ARM as a feature. If you have a proposed trial map, you can click a button and get these simulations and be able to check for yourself whether the proposed randomization you have is going to behave you when you want it to do. In order to do that, I borrowed data from the Agridat library. Um, this is by Kevin Wright, who is with, I believe it's Corteva now. He is a statistician um, and he has been uh, providing this package for a long time. It is a great reference um, for uh, agricultural data source and uh, ways of doing analysis in R. A lot of the examples I've used over the years to develop uh, methodology in ARM 
it turns out Kevin Wright had already entered that into an ARR package. Um, and then sometimes I did this after I already typed the data into an ARM trial file. Um, so I've been doing simulations based on these publicly available um, simulation set. And it's, and, and it's a method that we can incorporate really easily um, to give you the opportunity to do these type of simulations for your proposed randomizations. Um, and, but one of the, the, the challenges we find with this is we get very different behaviors depending on the, the source of data. And I am going to go back to this idea that we have a random field that is not always easy to describe. Um, and, and so, and it interacts with our proposed randomization. We tend to see some similarities though, is the type of trials here that control type one error rate uh, in Mercer also control type one error rate in the Weeb data set. In the Odlin data set, it controlled the type one error rate. Um, and even you know, looking in below, they tend to be towards one or the other. So there are some similarities um, among these different data sets. And notice there's also going to be some different patterns with the total number of trials that we simulate over. We also see some differences in the power analysis, whereas the uh, Mercer data set, I, I found a percent mean difference of 22. In the Weeb data set, I, would I went to 20%, 7% mean difference, and I could not achieve a power of even 30% in that simulated data. Um, the PAPL data set um, gave me a percent mean difference that's at 80% power of about 15. This is somewhat related to the coefficient of variances where the Mercer data set had a coefficient of variance of 11. The PAPO data set had a coefficient of variance of seven. Um, and the Korea data set and the Weave data set had much higher coefficient of variances. So this is kind of a tool um, that if you're using the power and efficiency dialogue to explore possible randomizations, um, this is also giving you a tool to understand how these parameters that we put into power and efficiency help us determine replicates. Now, when I had started thinking about this seminar, uh, I had been doing this in R and I had been doing it over uh, yield monitor data as a source of uniformity trial because a yield monitor data is a uniformity experiment. It's uniform crop yield. There's no treatment effect. We just have observations of yields. There are some advantages to this um, over uniformity from the literature is the uniformity trials, their plots are very different dimensions. Some of these, particularly in the, uh, the early ones like the Mercer data set from 1911, they had not standardized on a, uh, an industrial plot size where you, know, you have an industrial uh, research combine where you manage a plot of specific dimensions. Um, and we don't always have access to data from the similar crops. And so I, I pulled this graph out from some of the earlier work I was doing. This is some yield monitor data I have from my brother's farm. This represents corn, soybeans, and wheat over four different years. So I have different um, uniformity data uh, for a, a particular cropland. Now I can map this to uh, an ARM trial file, and this is just a brief overview. The, the lines, these circles represent the original yield monitor data. And I can infer that onto an exact plot dimension for my proposed trial and get an estimate of what the uniformity yield would have been had this been harvested as a uniformity map. Okay. So um, again, the, I referenced you a paper I did a few years ago. I, I might go into a little more detail on this process. And so um, given a field that's 60 meters by 360 meters, I had a trial of 72 plots and I assumed a four by six plot map with one uh, half meter and one meter buffers. Well, I can simulate over these four years, 80 trials per year for 320 non-overlapping trials. Remember in, in the uniformity I showed you, 
um, I had to make them overlap because the, I had the, the, the dimensions of the uniformity trial is smaller. Um, and what I can see is I, I want you to see from this is I'm sampling over different blotchy niches of the type of random variable we get in the field. Now the graph I did this in RGGplot2, notice that it gives us a similar shape to the uniformity trial for the trial as executed um, compared to 30 trials at random compared to my undesirable trial. So using this simulation, I get similar responses. What I found with this simulation is that when I compare the block sizes, I found a very much, a much larger effect of block size on my percent mean difference. When I simulated under these conditions and a one by 12 block size, I required about a 21% mean difference to detect significant differences among my treatments versus about a 16% mean difference when I had a block size of three by four. So in this simulation, I got a very big increase in my power for very little change in my trial map. The trouble is, um, and this is where I got myself, is these type of simulations take much longer to do. So they're not something that we can incorporate right now, at least um, as I'm thinking through it, as easily into a tool that we can provide um, this group of people here our clients as a way to understand the randomizations. So some future discussions on this, and I hope uh, to carry on with this, is how this can be a tool for validating randomizations not generated by ARM. Uh, I said, I had to cheat to get a randomization to show you what an invalid one looks like. I have seen randomizations. I've been asked to discuss analysis of experiments where I've looked at trial maps and said, I don't think that trial map was created in ARM. I'm not sure I can give you advice on how to analyze it. Um, this is a tool um, that might uh, help with that. Um, it might be a useful tool for visualizing the uniformity of randomizations over multiple trials. And what I'm thinking on this is a discussion about when you have a treatment by trial interaction, is it because the treatments are behaving differently over different locations? Or is it because the different randomizations have more or less bias? Um, think of the cheating trial versus the stringent trial. Perhaps that's where some of the interaction comes from. And the other is, how do we understand our restricted randomization options in ARM? That is our adjacency setting and our spatially balanced designs. That is, when we look at our treatment dispersion map, and so if you've seen this in your ARM dialogue and what these numbers mean, what I have added to this graph um, where we have our randomization simulations and we have our power simulations, we can show that for this particular randomization, it falls in about the middle of these 30 trials in our measure of standard deviation. That is our standard deviation from this trial is at about 4.3. Our measure of treatment dispersion, the standardization of 0.3 is about in the middle of all of these other possible randomizations. Um, the mean treatment difference and the maximum treatment difference um, fall at about the same, that they're somewhere in the middle. So this is a way to understand what this means because we can go to our spatially balanced design. And in our spatially balanced design, this number, this standard deviation of the treatment dispersion, so what I'm gonna call a metric of how well our treatments are dispersed about the field is very unusual when we compare it to 30 other randomizations taken at random. It is much lower dispersion. It's much more uniform dispersion. So our min and our max values are closer to each other. And we see that I will make the argument that we have a higher control of type one error because of this dispersion, which also implies that we might be sacrificing a little bit of type two treatment error when we choose this type of restricted randomization. But to go on to that, we would need to discuss how we compare those metrics and how you calculate those. 
So that is um, my end of my main talk for today. Uh, I'm going to pause for a minute and take either any questions over what I've covered so far. And I'm going to have a sip of tea. So my postscript then is the idea that you know we can we can check this um, by we can we can check other, other randomizations to see how good they were if we get a trial map that wasn't designed in ARM. And I did this ad hoc experiment where I am producing seed bombs. Um, and I want to see how well these seed bombs can be used to redistribute these native seeds. So this is essentially a seed treatment experiment where I took dirt and I mixed the dirt and clay mix and I packaged seeds in them. And then I took a dirt and seed clay mix that included biological fertilizer. So I set up a trial where I have my plain old seed bomb. And then I have my seed bomb with what's called Dr. Earth Flower Grow Organic and Natural Hand Blend. Okay, it's, it's got a lot of cool stuff in it. And I decided to coat these on commercial varieties of seed flower for a two by five factorial design. And I wasn't sure of how many seeds I actually had to plant. So I didn't really do my randomization until I got to the field where I was gonna put these sunflowers out. And so I finally decided I'm going to do five replicates, 10 plots each, two by five factorial. And I just walked through the field and I put the seeds out at random. And then I wrote down my trial map and entered in the ARM. And how good was my randomization? Well, here's the trial map to look at it. And here is the trial map that I would have gotten compared to 30 other randomizations. Um, and the treatment dispersion pattern. So you know what? This wasn't a bad randomization. Well, Annie had to ask me a question. How can I be sure to see that my ARM randomization won't give me a type one error? Unfortunately, we don't ever know that for sure. Um, this is a way that if we can find a simulated field data that is similar to what you think you're going to get, then um, you, can, you can explore on whether you want to accept this particular randomization or you click re-randomize and get another one. Um, one of the options that I would like to add to this button is give you an option to do 100 randomizations and allow you to choose, say, the one that is most likely to balance type one, type two error. And so um, this is where I, I'm hoping this is a small enough group we can have the discussion on how we can give you a way to use this and understand what's going on with your randomizations as they get put in the field. Um, so in this case, I think I found a randomization that worked pretty good. And I think I might be able to detect a statistical power somewhere between 18 and 21. Now, and remember this is when we do the power and setting, let's see, oh, but could it be better? Um, before I'll, I'll let, me, let me wrap this up because I only considered the dispersion of the treatments themselves, but I really want to dis, the, the, get the dispersions of my main effect, my variety effects, I don't, really care about. And so if I look at the dispersion of my treated seed bombs, you see they're clustered together a lot. Could I have improved this? Well, I found that if I did it as a split plot experiment where I put my seed bomb as the, um, the, the subplot effect, that I get better dispersion over the field of that seed bomb, uh, of that treatment effect. And that's really what I'm going to be concerned with. And so one of the things that I want to explore as far as an ARM feature is when we do these treatment dispersion metrics and our dispersion options, 
can we do that for the factor part of a factorial design? And there's one last picture. So I'm going to escape out of this. So yes, um, it might be an interesting tool to consider the quality of your randomizations. And so what I have done to show you today, and most of the graphs that I've shown you today, I have done through this, where I've added, pushed in here, a set of buttons that allow me to select a uniformity data set and the number of simulations that I want to run and whether I want to do statistical power and maybe take some time to understand what these metrics mean in combination with our proposed randomization. And yeah, I, and, and I hope it's a tool to help you understand um, what, uh, what is going on in our trial maps. Unfortunately, this is something oh, I'm running in code right now that does take a little bit of time. And so it's gonna take some uh, beta testing. Oh, let's see, where do I wanna go? Because this script takes about two or three minutes to run. Ah, so are there any other questions while we're waiting? Anything that anybody want to chat about? Let's see. Simulation 17 is done. Um, I did, should have sent out in the handout. Oh, let's see. Why am I not getting? So um, simulations uh, under Mercer of the ex the the design as executed. And let's see, why is this not popping up? So this is what we would be able to generate. Oh, this is the one that just did. Um, this is where we can look at our current simulation, um, a proposed randomization that minimizes our type one error, a proposed randomization that minimizes our type two error, and the one that is most fair and one option we could we could consider adding is when you do your trial map, you can pick, say, the the nominal, the one that gives you the, the fairest randomization. Okay, so that was oh, that's one I that's actually one I have in my diagram. So that's this one. Um, so Paul, Paul has asked, how can I leverage this as a spiral trial sponsor who is not actually conducting trials? Um, it, one thing that we can look at as part of, I, I'm considering as part of the summary of ST, is if you were to do this, and you can say, I, I can't accept this trial. If you were to run this on a trial that you got back from a user, and you do a simulation like this, you can look at it and say, I, I just can't accept this data. Um, I don't know how you did your randomization, but you didn't randomize according to what we expect. Um, in an ARM protocol, you can specify that you use the spatially balanced design. You can specify that you set, um, if we go to our settings, you can specify this treatment adjacency setting to ensure that you get a uniform distribution, that you don't get an undesirable randomization. Uh, I can say, you know, that I have looked at interesting, uh, I've looked at trial maps that I don't know where the randomization comes from, but I don't suspect it came from ARM because we don't generate those. And 
they give high type one error rates. So this is something that we can think about how to incorporate into a report option that lets you look at, um, so consider per example, say this represents um, say four trials from ST and the potential universe of randomizations it could have come from. Um, you can look to see if you are getting a balanced set of randomizations when you do in a summary. This is probably a quicker way to look at that than to examine each trial map individually. Um, the other one that I found out Yeah, um, uh, Luigi asked as a sponsor, you, del you deliver the randomization you want and then what are the acceptable deviations? Um, yes, because then you have control over, uh, you have control exactly over this. And then whether or not someone edits the trial map to match it, um, that's, that's something that you could track. Um, and so, yeah, you could have an understanding of the type of experiments you put out. Um, one last one I'm gonna point out at the simulation um, that there is one experimenter I know of who has a um, technician for some reason uses the exact same randomization for every location in in the in the during the year. So he'll do one randomization, plant that eighteen times. If you do this simulation. Under the null hypothesis, those are identical randomizations. You would see 18 lines that are exactly overlapping. And you're saying, well, it's over different location. Maybe it's not a problem. But in every location, you might have, say, treatment two next to treatment three every time. And so you're introducing a potential correlation structure with this selection of randomizations. Um, that you don't want to induce. You want, you want this, some diversity among your randomizations. So that's another potential tool I see as a sponsor is a way of looking at the quality of your randomizations over multiple trials to see that you are maybe getting a, a selection of fair randomizations or that you're getting a selection of nominal type one, type two randomizations. So that when you get to your summary analysis, um, you, you've balanced your type one, type two error. Um, I didn't do this with the simulations of the spatially balanced design, but when I do multiple randomizations of spatially balanced, I tend to have a higher type one error rate. Um, and I'm still kind of working through the mathematics of the implication of that. So I, I, I hope this is uh, giving us some good discussions on what we can do um, to help you understand not just the analysis side, which we, we, we've kind of focused on over the last year with the diagnostics, but now diagnostics of the quality of your trials before you place them in the field. So I think we're about in uh, coming to the end of our time limit. So I thank you for listening to me. I thank you for your questions. Um, and I hope we come back with some more discussion on this. So thank you very much, Matt. I think you can go ahead and stop recording.